In the next 60 seconds, 16 people somewhere in the world will die from cancer. In Australia alone, 125 people's lives will be cut short by cancer today and every single day throughout the year. Just take a moment and have a look at the two people sitting beside you. The statistics tells us that either you or one of them will be diagnosed with cancer by your 85th birthday. Now, the good news is that for many types of cancer, effective treatments are available. Commonly, these treatments involve removing the tumour from the body through surgery and using chemotherapy drugs or radiation to kill the cancer cells or slow their growth. Now, these therapies are effective because they poison the cancer cells, but they also poison healthy cells, which causes debilitating side effects, severe fatigue, nausea, hair and weight loss, and an increased susceptibility to infection. Our surgery and other treatments are similarly associated with some pretty horrid side effects that impede our ability to function normally, to speak, to breathe easily, to digest our food, to control our bowel movements, and even to have sex. Our cancer is really hard to kill, so the aggressiveness of these treatments is extreme. Doctors have to weigh up the effectiveness of these treatments against the severity of the side effects. In essence, it's a balancing act between killing the patient's cancer and killing their quality of life. But what if there was a medicine that could tip the scales towards helping these treatments kill the cancer or diminishing the severity of the side effects? What if there was a medicine that could do both? Sounds pretty far-fetched, right? But preliminary research shows that this may be possible. This new contender stepping into the ring to help in the fight against cancer isn't the heavyweight prize fighter that we would typically expect. Hippocrates, the ancient Greek physician, recognizes the father of medicine, professed the benefits of this therapy in treating disease, and he prescribed it to his patients. Fast forward a couple of thousand years and considerable scientific investigation later, and we're faced with the provocative hypothesis that a medicine first discovered in ancient times may lead to a breakthrough in the fight against cancer. What is this medicine? Exercise. <laughs> now, I don't know much about ancient history, but I am a bit of an exercise tragic. I've always been fascinated by how our bodies adapt to exercise and the dramatic impact that exercise can have on our physical capacity. It's likely that this curiosity was sparked by the countless hours I spent as a child trying to beat the boys at every possible sport. I was a classic tomboy. But as I studied and I researched what happens inside our bodies when we exercise, I became more and more enthralled and particularly by the impact that exercise can have on the lives of people with cancer. Now, when I talk about exercise, I mean a structured prescription of very specific types of exercise at precise intensities and volumes based on the physiological changes required to improve health. Now, this could be running, cycling, swimming, or lifting weights. There's early evidence to suggest that exercise may slow the spread of cancer and could possibly even add more days, months, years to patients' lives. Now, we've got a lot more to discover about the potential of exercise to extend survival, but the theory of how this happens is fascinating. It could be as simple as enhancing our ability to physically tolerate more cancer treatments. For many patients, treatments need to be modified or stopped because the side effects are so severe. But if exercise allows us to get more cancer treatments, the tumour can continue to be attacked by more and more cancer-killing agents. It's also possible that exercise may actually improve the effectiveness of these treatments. The tumours change the blood vessels around them, which can restrict the amount of cancer-killing agents actually reaching the cells. There's early research that suggests that exercise acts to normalise these blood vessels around the tumours 
And by getting around these roadblocks, more drugs and more of the body's own natural defence mechanisms can continue to attack the disease. What exercise also does is it improves our overall immune system. So it's possible that these cancer cells can be flooded by an even bigger wave of our body's own natural cancer-killing agents. In addition to this, it's proposed that exercise acts to control some of the hormones that stimulate the spread of cancer. And we think that exercise may change the way the genes associated with cancer are switched on and off. The theory is that exercise turns on genes that slow the spread of cancer. So the more you exercise, the more your genes tell your body to kill the cancer cells. Now, through each of these varied processes, it's possible that exercise acts to supercharge the way our bodies fight cancer. In essence, waging a war with a well-equipped army of battleships and fighter jets, compared to just a few thousand foot soldiers. Now, I'm a researcher. And the claims we make are cautious. You know, this isn't tabloid TV. We don't yet definitively know if exercise can extend survival, and we're a lot further away from understanding how and why it may occur. But what we do know is encouraging. Based on this early evidence, it suggests that exercise may play a role in helping existing treatments slow the spread of cancer. Now, years of further research are required to evaluate whether it's reasonable to assume or uh, consider exercise as a prescribable anti-cancer therapy. But let's also consider the other side of the cancer treatment equation, the severity of side effects. If we took the exercise medicine pill or the bottle and we turned it around to read the list of warnings on the back, what would they be? Our research shows that a targeted prescription of exercise medicine leads to reduced fatigue, an improved ability to do everyday tasks, enhanced strength and fitness, and reductions in depression and anxiety. Preliminary research also shows that exercise may help counteract the sexual dysfunction caused by prostate cancer treatment and improve sexual desire in men. Now, that's an exciting thought. But this isn't the whole story. The impact of exercise medicine on the lives of people with cancer extends beyond these physiological changes to their health. I was talking to one of our patients, John, and he said something really quite remarkable to me. He said, you know what, Prue? I'm actually glad that I got cancer because I've never felt better. Being involved with this exercise program has changed my life. How can anyone be glad they got cancer? And how could something as simple as an exercise program change his life? The exercise that John was prescribed led to considerable improvements in his physical well-being, but it also improved his mental well-being and his social well-being. John's choice to engage in the exercise program meant that he was actively involved in the fight against his cancer. It gave him a purpose, and it was something that he had control over at one of the darkest times of his life. Exercise medicine introduced John to a bunch of other blokes of a similar age going through the same experience, and the relaxed environment of a gym provided a sanctuary for the guys to talk about their cancer and how they were coping with it all. John's story isn't an isolated one, and these effects aren't exclusive to a particular type of cancer. In fact, based on what the science tells us, there's no pill or procedure that shows more promise to improve quality of life than exercise medicine. When the potential of exercise to extend survival is coupled with the clear benefits to quality of life, there's a strong argument for exercise to be incorporated in every cancer patient's treatment. Hospitals should be employing exercise physiologists to give expert advice and dedicating space to exercise facilities. Instead of sitting in waiting rooms, patients could be exercising before their chemotherapy or after their radiation treatment. And this is starting to happen. Right here in Perth, there are cancer treatment centres that now have gyms. Investing in these facilities and incorporating exercise in the prescription toolkit of doctors is likely to represent a healthcare bargain. 
It's a relatively small cost that will save considerable healthcare expenditure. Now, of course, changing the behaviour of patients would be difficult, but doctors can convince their patients to do incredible things. If patients can be convinced to undergo major surgery or chemotherapy, why shouldn't we be able to convince them to exercise? The medical community, governments, insurers are yet to recognise the potential value of exercise medicine in cancer care. And it's likely that many years of further research and advocacy work will be required to prompt changes in the health system. But let me propose a question to you. Imagine you've been diagnosed with breast or prostate cancer and you're sitting in your doctor's office. The doctor starts explaining an experimental medicine that may improve your chances of living longer. This medicine would be administered in addition to your standard cancer treatments. It isn't thought to interfere with the effectiveness of those treatments and it may actually improve their ability to fight your cancer. They warn that this medicine will be physically demanding and stipulate that you're required to devote three to five hours a week to the treatment. Now, like any medicine, there are the potential of side effects, which include the risk of injury. Much to your surprise, these side effects also include improved physical and mental well-being. Your doctor concludes by saying that this medicine is still in the experimental stage and there are no guarantees that it'll improve your prognosis. But early observations suggest that it may reduce the relative risk of dying from your cancer by 50 to 60 per cent. Would you take it? Thank you.